Good evening. It is December the 23rd, and this is our Wednesday night video from Park Street Christian Church here in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. While Christmas shopping, I remembered a time-honored tradition. An experienced jeweler doesn't casually lay a precious diamond on the countertop for a customer to examine. No. First, he lays a piece of black, pitch black, velvet cloth on the counter, smooths it out, and then he carefully positions the glittering diamond on that dark cloth so that the gemstone's sparkle and beauty are seen in contrast. I want to suggest to you tonight that we need to see the Christmas accounts in Scripture in contrast to the blackness of our sin. It's the black backdrop of despair that makes the birth of Jesus Christ so meaningful. The angel told Joseph to name the baby Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins, as recorded in Matthew 1, 21. Max Lucado wrote, we, we have to see the mess that we're in before we can appreciate the God that we have. Before presenting the grace of God, we must understand the wrath of God. Jesus did not come to earth to save us from a low self-esteem, poverty, or ignorance. He came to save us from the black hole of our horrid transgressions. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we need to understand that Jesus came to ultimately save us from the consequences of our sin. Sin condemns us to hell. If Jesus hadn't been born in Bethlehem, we would all be destined to eternal separation from God in a fiery pit. Almost everyone knows John 3.16, but do you know the next paragraph? John 3, 17 and 18 say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Sin had already separated the human race from God and condemned all mankind to hell. But Jesus' death on the cross paid the price for our sin and provided a way for us to spend eternity with God in heaven where there's no pain, no sorrow, and no tears. No wonder the angels told the shepherds in Luke 2, verse 10 and 11, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So Jesus came to save us from the consequences of our sin, but he also came to save us from the guilt of sin. Satan deviously promises us pleasure, but when the temper, temporary gratification fades away, we live in the wake of a guilty conscience. We quickly regret our behavior and we long for a redo. However, we can't erase and relive the past mistakes. But the Bible promises the blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sin. And if anyone's in Christ, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, He's a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. After committing adultery with Bathsheba, David wrote in Psalm 32, verse 5, Then I acknowledged that my sin to you did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So Jesus came to save us from the consequences of our sin. He came to save us from the guilt of our sin. And he came to save us from the enslavement of sin. Almost every sin is as addictive as cocaine. One hit does not satisfy very long. The law of increased appetite and diminishing returns soon takes over until we're trapped in alcoholism or pornography or deception or affairs shoplifting or gluttony or selfishness, pride, greed, or hatred, and we can't stop. Recovery groups have a slogan that says, one is too many and a thousand is not enough. 
The Apostle Paul warned in Romans 6.16, Don't you know that you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But Jesus came to ultimately set the captive free, to empower us by the person of the Holy Spirit indwelling us to experience the victory that overcomes the world. Someone once said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is dreadful, dark, and deadly. Now, we live in an age where we have done everything possible in our culture to eliminate truth. Truth is only what works for you. And if it does, your truth doesn't work for me, then, then I live by my own truth. And so we are essentially eliminating all truth. And so we're going to be like the people in the book of Judges who did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the culture that we have right now. And people are getting enslaved in lifestyles, seeking freedom, pleasure. And yet all of these things are entrapping people. And there's desperate people all around us today in our culture. So understand, sin is dreadful, dark, deadly. But Jesus came to completely save us from the consequences, the guilt, and the enslavement of sin. He paid the exorbitant price of an excruciating death on the cross where Isaiah 53, 6 says, God laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He died so that we can be forgiven. And he rose from the dead to prove we too can be freed from the shackles of sin. There's a popular worship song in churches that's been used for a number of years now that proclaims in the lyrics, My chains are gone, I've been set free, for God my Savior has ransomed me. So the big question this Christmas is, are you saved from your sin? Are you saved from your sin? Have you received the free gift offered to you through Jesus Christ? Or are you still trapped in the black despair of your sin? If you're not saved from your sin, here's in a nutshell what the Bible instructs you to do. First, put your complete trust in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for your sin and not your own goodness. So I'll repeat that. Put your complete trust in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, his sacrifice on the cross, and not on your own goodness. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Once you have decided that you're going to completely trust in Jesus Christ's death on the cross to, to eliminate your sin, to forgive you, because you can't forgive yourself, you can't pay that unpayable price, then humbly repent of your sins, which means to turn away from them, to make it about face, a U-turn from living a life that said, I want to do what I want to do, I don't want God's way, to a life that says, I'm not going to do what I want to do, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to turn to Him. I'm going to turn away from my 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 sinfulness, my own self-centeredness. So you humbly repent of your sins and you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your daily life. He is the boss of you every day and night. You live to please and honor him. In Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will all likewise perish. And then we are to boldly proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ. And we need to be willing to do that in front of others. In Matthew chapter 10, 
verse 32 and 33. Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I'll acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. We're to proclaim our faith, our belief in Jesus Christ, that we're trusting in him for our salvation, not ourselves. But it goes beyond just a one-time proclamation, again, to picking up our cross, which simply means to die to ourself, our, to living our way, and to live God's way, and it's a daily decision we have to make. Um, Jesus commanded us. He said, if anyone would come after me, he has to deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me every day. And then we are to be immersed in baptism as a benchmark of your new life in Christ. In the book of Acts, we have many examples of people actually becoming Christians. And so that book is our key source of instruction regarding what do we do to become a Christian. And on the day of Pentecost, thousands and thousands of Jewish uh, followers were gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Pentecost festival. God used that occasion to launch his church. Peter and the other apostles preached on that day in a miraculous way to get this message to as many people gathered there as possible. Thousands and thousands were gathered there, and they each were from, they were uh, believers in Judaism. They were Jewish ancestry, but they were from many different nations, and so they spoke many different languages, but somehow on this day they heard the apostles preaching each in their own native tongues, their own native language. But the message was primarily about the fact they had turned their back on the one they claimed they were waiting on, God's Messiah, and they crucified him. They disowned him, and the Romans put him to death. And yet God had raised him to the dead, and when these Jewish people understood this, they were convicted, they repented of their belief or their sin of rejecting Jesus. Now they're willing to turn to him, yield to him as the one in charge of their life. And they interrupted the preaching and said, what shall we do? How, how do we solve this dilemma we've got ourselves in? We've rejected Christ. And Peter answered and said, repent, every one of you. Be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 2.38. Baptism by immersion is not optional. It's not something to think about doing sometime, town, uh, sometime down the later uh, in our lives. It's not anything to put off. It needs to be done immediately upon coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We have example after example in the book of Acts. Again, the history of the birth and early years of the church. And it's our primary source of authority once again for how do we become a Christian here under the new covenant? The covenant changed from the moment Jesus died on the cross. He died under the Old Testament law. And when he launched his church, the new covenant became uh, in force. But we're to continue to trust in Christ then and his love for us, even though we are going to stumble and fall on occasion after we first surrender to Jesus and we're born again. Way back in the book of 1 John, the uh, little epistle of 1 John, the third chapter, John says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and that's what we are. So, once you are adopted into the family of God, we're to continue to live daily, dying to ourselves and living for Christ's purposes in our life. We're going to fall. We're going to sin. And in 1 John chapter 1, uh, John addresses that issue. When he says in verse um, 7, If we walk in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. 
verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And here's the key verse, verse 9, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, this is as believers. John was writing this to Christians to help them understand this whole uh, epistle of 1 John. It was a letter to instruct them how they could have assurance that they are indeed saved, even though we all sin after we become Christian. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to... For, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, uh, we're going to sin after we follow Christ, make that first initial decision. But we acknowledge daily, when we know we have sinned, we acknowledge that to our Heavenly Father. And to confess those sins to Him, to confess simply means I agree with. I agree with what God says in his word about my sin. I don't try to cover it up. I don't try to, to uh, pass it off as not serious. Just a little bad habit I'm wrestling with. I don't make excuses for it. I call it what it was, what it is, a sin, according to what God says, not what man says. I confess that to him. And he gives me the power and strength to... Uh, live a holier life and depending on his power in me to do better the next time, the next day, to put that behind me because he forgives it. He buries that sin in the depths of the deepest sea and remembers those, those sins no more, we're told. He casts that sin as far as the east is from the west. He will not hold us accountable for that sin that we honestly confess before him as believers. But we have to live a repentant lifestyle of dying to self and following Jesus every day. That's the most important question you can answer this Christmas season. Among thousands of questions that people are asking right now or things that are happening in our world is, are we saved from sin? Are you saved from sin? And in First Peter, Chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, Peter says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So, my friends, if you have any questions about any of this, reach out to me, um, call me, email me, I'll be glad to help you any possible way that I can. Um, but Merry Christmas. Rejoice. For unto you and all mankind is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Merry Christmas.